I thought I would uh, comment today on some of the ideas that are floating around in the ether about, well, about so many things. Anyway, uh, so to understand uh, the uh, why these different ideas about uh, UFOs coming down and one world conspiracy and all these different theories. <clears throat> to understand why that's happening, we have to understand uh, the situation today in this modern age. We know Kali Yuga. We know this age as the age of Kali. The age of quarrel, confusion, spiritual darkness. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur has uh, written in the Harinam Chintamani uh, an interesting observation. He said that in the age of Kali, more and more people uh, take up a religious process which is generally known as Tantra. And this is ha occurring all over the world. Now we should explain what is this Tantra. So, Tantra... Uh, is a word. It actually means means different things. The word means book. Uh, like there's a book called Pancha Tantra, the five books of stories. So in general, Tantra means book. But in in a particular context, this this word book is indicating a certain kind of scripture called Agama. Uh, so Agama means that which comes down through some very esoteric tradition. Hare Krishna. I am not comprehending this morning's schedule. I'm just giving this class. I don't know what's happening now. <laughs> huh? Oh, really? I was told the class can be as long as I want. Oh, okay. This is, a, this is also Tantra, esoteric knowledge. <laughs> No one really knows what's going on. <laughs> anyway. So Agama, Agama, that which comes down, this is uh, tradition, uh, esoteric tradition of knowledge. Now even in, even in our uh, uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, there is Agama, Tantra. But it is in the uh, transcendental mode of goodness, Vasudev Sattva. But from this uh, Vaishnava Agama, we get the whole uh, tradition of deity worship, uh -huh. Pancharatra. So, you know, because you can inquire into why is it that we do these things in just this way in Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. And then you see in other Sampradayas, they do deity worship in, in different ways. They may have different mantras, different rituals. Why is it like that? And that's all uh, Agama. It's, it's not something you can pin down really. Uh, in Veda, uh, Agama, tradition, a little esoteric. Anyway, we accept it because uh, we receive our uh, uh, Vaishnava Tantra or Pancharatra from Acharyas, their fully Krishna conscious, realized souls. So their instructions on this matter we can accept. But now this uh, term Tantra is generally applied to the agama or esoteric tradition in the mode of ignorance generally that's whenever you heard the hear the word tantra being used you see books in the bookstores talking about tantra they're talking about mode of ignorance so this is worship not of vishnu as we are doing krishna chaitanya mahaprabhu lord nichananda but that type of tantra is worship of maya uh, and in India, it is called the uh, Shakta tradition, uh, worship of Goddess Durga. So in this uh, Shakta Tantra, there are two divisions. One is called Dakshina Marg, and one is called Vama Marg. Dakshina Marg means the right-hand path, Vama Marg means the left-hand path. Now in the right-hand path, uh, 
Durga Devi is wor- worshipped in temples, in her forms, uh, according to some set procedure, puja procedure. They follow rules and regulations. And the whole point of that, of course, there's many things going on. Uh, uh, worship for, you know, benediction, receiving benedictions. People are coming and making offerings and praying for different kinds of material benedictions. That's all going on in the right-hand path. And the priests uh, have are supposed to have clairvoyant powers. They get from Goddess Durga and they can tell the future. You know, you, you have some problem, he can tell you how it will be resolved in the future and so on. He can tell you so many things. Uh, this is especially seen, this type of right-hand tantra is very prominent in South India. And uh, in Malaysia, where a lot of South Indians have gone, this is very, very big thing. So anyway, uh, now the whole point of this right-hand path of Tantra, the, ult- the ultimate, you can say the Vedic goal of it, the progressive goal, is just to come to the point to see every, that every man sees every woman as mother and every woman sees every man, except, her, except husband and wife we're talking about, outside of husband and wife relationship. The man is seeing women as mother and the mother is seeing man as son. That's the whole point of it, because it, they're worshipping Durga Devi as the Supreme Mother. And uh, then uh, females, female human beings are representatives of Durga Devi. So they're uh, the same mother principle. And uh, the men are the sons, like that. So we, this, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, <laughs> step one, this is kindergarten bhakta program. <laughs> The first day, <laughs> we tell the bhaktas, you know, you must see the women as your mother, and we tell the bhaktins, you must see the men as your son. And this, in this way, uh, we can go on in a social setting as devotees, just like here, men and women together, serving Krishna. And naturally, there is there must be some relationship between men and women. We cannot pretend that you know the other half of the temple is just not there. <laughs> <laughs> It's impossible. So there has to be some kind of relationship. But this is the proper relationship. If one is not married, then one should see... That's why we refer to the ladies as Madhiji. Mother. So there's this whole, you know, right-hand tantric path, you know, to, with all this weird stuff going on. <laughs> Just to bring people to that point. Then they're advanced, actually. They're, they're, they're advanced in that right-hand tantra when they finally understand that... Uh, Every woman is my mother. Every woman represents Durga Devi, except my wife. So all that big to do just to come to that point which we say on the first day in Krishna consciousness. So then, then there's a left-hand path. Now this is, this is more relevant to what's going on today all over the world. The left-hand path, actually the whole thing, the whole, this whole... Uh, uh, worship of Maya, it's all in the mode of ignorance. But the left-hand path is especially in the mode of ignorance. And that's where they're not considering Durga Devi as mother. But rather, the worshippers are considering themselves to be Shiva. Shivoham, I am Shiva. And that means Durga is my consort. So in this mood, they worship Durga Devi. And so out of this whole tradition, it, it gets really bizarre, it... Uh, there's no limit to, to how it unfolds. And that's where you get all this uh, uh, sex yoga. You know, there's so many books in these New Age bookstores here in Copenhagen about tantric sex. So, in, in this way, the, uh, the man is representing Shiva, the woman is representing Durga, and they combine in some sex yoga. And they're supposed to get some enlightenment from this. You know. <laughs> Weird things going on. That's one example. Another, another thing out of this left-hand tantric tradition, uh, tradition is something, uh, something like voodoo. Actually, you can say voodoo is a, is a because this is all over the world. So voodoo is another form of it. In fact, in fact, in Haiti where they practice voodoo, they even call their priests the priests who put spells on people and all these things, these you know, who make people into zombies. They call them in their language bokor which means the priest who uses the left hand. 
And in India, you know, so many thousands of miles away, they're calling these same kind of tantrics Vama Margis, left hand. So, you know, you can see it's all over the world. And so they're into summoning up ghosts and evil spirits, which are all the shaktis of, of the uh, horrible forms of Durga, like Kali, Chamunda, and so on. So, uh, and also uh, horrible forms of Shiva too, Kala Bhairava. So they have their their ghostly, their ganas, ghostly associates. And so these tantrics, they summon them and they, you know, get powers from them. And So so many things are going on in this left-hand tantric tradition. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur has said that uh, this religion, in the mode of ignorance, tantra, is becoming the dharma of Kali Yuga, becoming the general religious path everywhere around the world. So now when we speak of dharma, uh, there are three phases. There's always three phases of Dharma. And that we know from Prabhupada's books. Very uh, basic information. Uh, karma, Jnana and Bhakti. Uh, in Vedic Dharma, we find there are these three phases. There's some people who take Vedic Dharma in, the, as a, uh, in mentality of karmis. So they understand Vedic Dharma in that way. And then there's the Jnanis. They have their understanding. And then there's the devotees. They have their understanding. So, uh, that is also going on in this mode of ignorance, Dharma. And we see this in the Western world. You have, um, uh, as an example of the karma phase, you have the materialists. Prabhupada clearly says the materialistic scientists are shaktas. He clearly says that. I know of two purports in Srimad Bhagavatam where Prabhupada says like that. The materialistic scientists are an example in the Western world of shaktas, of worshippers of the material energy. Uh, but their approach is, you can say, naturalistic. Uh, they're uh, they're under, understanding everything as material energy, and uh, uh, there's no soul. Consciousness is just a creation of material combination. We're just products of nature, and we should just be natural. So their whole scientific investigation is aimed at establishing uh, what they think is some kind of uh, a better harmony with nature. So in the schools, that's why in the schools, you know, these, these uh, uh, scientists and educators have established this uh, sex education for, you know, children <laughs> seven years old, <laughs> nine years old like that, teach them how to have sex because it's natural. And like that. So that's going on. So in this way, everyone can be, you know, just like they're studying in order to formulate their naturalistic philosophy, they're studying rats and, and, uh, and other creatures. They're letting them run through mazes and giving them drugs and seeing what they do, all this stuff going on. And from this, they draw the conclusions about how human beings behave. So then their principles they are establishing in society is simply to make human beings into animals. They think that's natural. So that's the karma phase, uh, materialism, naturalism. Then there's the jnana phase, which is another kind of philosophy, uh, which is called functionalism. Now this is, a, this is a bona fide term coming from the scientific world. This is another ki- class of scientists. They're called functionalists. And they're, they're, in, they're into consciousness. The materialists are not really into consciousness as a as an uh, uh, ingredient or as an element. They pretty much ignore it. Uh, they're just looking at, at, uh, at the body. But these functionalists, they're into consciousness, but they understand consciousness in a quite material way. Their analogy is a computer program. Huh? So this is where this term functionalism comes. That, uh, you know, just like you have a, in a computer, your diskette with a program, and that's to perform a particular function. You have your computer, you stick the disk in, and then you get a program, and then you can do something. And then when you want to do something else, you change the program. So this is how they understand functionalism. Uh, this is how they understand consciousness, in terms of function. They admit that there's consciousness, but it's a very materialistic understanding of it. So, but it leads to <clears throat> interesting conclusions about reality. 
that if uh, consciousness is programmable, then reality is also programmable. In other words, you can have different realities. You see, this, this is actually the, the Mayavadi, the real Mayavadi aspect, this functionalism. That uh, according to a person's uh, consciousness, consciousness that's been programmed into his head, then he will perceive the world in a certain way. And that's real for him. This is, this is the functionalist philosophy. That's real. And someone else can perceive it in another way. And that's also real. And ultimately it's all one. So there, there are scientists uh, who, are, who are getting into this functionalism. They're studying consciousness. Uh, but they have very materialistic aims. And uh, the whole New Age, this whole New Age movement is coming out of this. Uh, they're into alternate realities and uh, all these things. Uh, another thing that's coming out of this, because it all really had a big mushroom in the 1960s, the hippie movement. So the New Age came out of the hippie movement. The New Science came out of the hippie movement. Also, uh, the drug culture, this is another form of functionalism. You know, according to the drug you take, then you shift into another reality. So this is, the drug heads are also functionalists. And not only that, the pornographers. Pornography is also another, it's a kind of destructive phase of functionalism. Because these functionalists, they're mayavadis. So some are constructive, some are looking at changing reality in a positive way. And others are nihilists. They just want to break everything down, make it void, make it to nothing. And that's, uh, these pornographers are doing like that. Because uh, sex, sex life is a very uh, destructive, powerful force. And uh, uh, if it is unleashed on society, you know, propagated like that, it will break everything down. And that's what these... Uh, pornographers are doing. They have a philosophy of ridiculing the whole, they're ridiculing the whole uh, uh, setup of society, all the, the serious uh, goal-orient, what you call goal-oriented uh, activity, you know, going to work, uh, earning money, building up society. They ridicule it with their pornography. Uh, and they're encouraging people to simply surrender to sex impulse under any circumstances doesn't matter <laughs> this is what pornography depicts you know sex life on the job sex life in the hospital they have all these different kinds of movies about these things they they make these fantasies and so the whole thing is just to just to break down everyone's conception of reality uh, uh, anyway <laughs> this is functionalism in different phases and then you have the dualists. This is the third. This is the uh, degraded bhakti. Degraded bhakti. It's coming right out of uh, Christianity and uh, Jude Judeo-Christianity, they call it, the Jewish and Christian tradition. So dualism. Dualism means there's some idea of spirit and matter duality, but actually it's, it's framed in terms of good and evil. You know, God and Satan, like that. So they understand two principles. The functionalists bring it down. They, 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 there's only one principle. They're real mayavadis. And the materialists are just materialists. They're simply seeing the material energy. So uh, the dualists, Judeo-Christians, um, they are... Uh, 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 yes, they're trying to establish their own you know sense of morality on this world they have their they have their own agenda um, one thing that's interesting oh yes yeah what I wanted to say is it was just slipping my mind they're also tantrics this is what I wanted to some some people may think well what what does Christianity have to do with tantricism it's definitely it's really heavy tantra but it's more like this right hand path but you see, you know, because the original form of Christianity in Europe is Catholicism, Roman Catholic Church. So you look at the rituals in the Roman Catholic Church, they're tantric, purely tantric. They're worshipping the mother, Maria. So this is a tantric conception. 
And how do they worship her? With wine. <laughs> and this is going on in India. <laughs> they worship Durga Devi. And, and not only that, Maria is a virgin. And this is also in... in, in uh, there's, a, there's a division of tantric practice in India called Uttara Kaula, where they worship virgin girls with wine. And, and she's symbolizing, you know, the universal mother. So this is this is this is right there in the Catholic Church. They have a whole liturgy, ritual, everything. <laughs> the priests are, you know, doing their things. They have their wine and they're drinking at different times. You know, they have to drink the wine because they're receiving the mercy of uh, whoever it is. <laughs> so at a certain time of the ritual, they have to drink, they're chanting mantras. The whole this is tantra. This is tantra. Uh, and then then there was you know then there was a split. Uh, the Protestant religion uh, rebelled against this, but uh, you know they rebelled against all those rituals. But they themselves developed another kind of tantra, and that's like uh, like you see in this uh, Freemasons. You know, the Masons they have a very esoteric. This is this is all coming out of the Protestant tradition. In Italy, all the Protestants they become Masons because the Catholic Church is so powerful. There's always been a, a conflict between Protestants and Catholics, so it manifests in that way. That the Protestants become Masons, and they have in their Masonic lodges their own secret rituals. And it's all tantric also, very clearly tantric. They even have the... Anyway, I shouldn't get into these things. <laughs> I won't say. <laughs> but really, really tantric stuff. So, uh, yeah, these are, the, these are the dualists. Good, evil. And, and they're... Um, uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll come back to this point. Um, what I want to say is that, as we see in, in India, in the history of India, there have been many cults that have come out in the Kali Yuga. The Tantric cults, the Buddhist cults, the Jain cults. They're all different varieties of the same thing. And every one of these cults, they have their own Purana and Itihasa. Just like in the original tradition, the Vedic tradition, there is Purana and Itihasa. That means histories, stories to illustrate their point of view, to defend their point of view. Uh, they always refer to some story. Uh, so all these cults in India, they had their own, like the Buddhists had their Jataka stories and the Jains have their stories and the Tantrics have their stories. Uh, so in the West also, all the, these different groups in the Karma phase, Jnana phase, bhakti, perverted Bhakti phase, they have their own histories and stories and explanations of things. Now this is where you get this conspiracy business comes out of this. Now... I'm referring today, you know, there's conspiracy theories today about how the whole world is being controlled by the Rockefellers or, or the Rothschilds or the somebody like that. Some mysterious figures, a few, you know, round table of nine families or something, richest families in the world, and they're pulling all the strings and, uh, you know, west and east, everyone's under their control and they're just getting more and more control. So this is nothing new. These conspiracy theories uh, can be traced all the way back uh, to, uh, in the West, we can trace them back, well, way, 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 way back actually, but, but for our purposes it's convenient to start with uh, the story of Jesus. So, you know, Jesus was betrayed by the Jews, that was a conspiracy. And he was hung on the cross, but he came back to life, all of that. And then in, soon after uh, 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 Christ, then there came various struggles in the church. There was struggles between the Christians and the Jews. The Christians accused the Jews of having conspired to murder Jesus. So this, this whole thing has come down to the present day. There's always been a, a constant conflict between those two camps. There was conflicts between different camps of Christians also in the early days. And each one accusing the other of conspiracy, trying to take over. And this is uh, this has just come down down through history. It's called actually the philosophy of history. Uh, that that we're evolving, struggling. History is a struggle, an evolution. 
evolving to a certain point. This, this is all arising out of Christianity. According to these Christian dualists, the point, the final point of evolution will be the triumph of good over evil when Christ comes back. So they explain this whole, and they're all their conspiracy theories in this term. You know, that right now the world is being ruled by satanic forces. They've taken over. And only those who have the, you know, this, this secret insight that we're giving can be saved from these satanic forces. And soon Jesus will come back and then the satanic forces will be defeated and all those who are on the side of the satanic forces, knowingly or unknowingly, they'll be, you know, they'll enter the lake of fire or whatever. <laughs> and then only the, the true Christians who knew what was going on, they'll inherit the earth. So this is the dualistic version of the conspiracy theory. And you must know, as I said, it goes, it goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The, these theories you, you see today are simply transformations, modern transformations of theories that existed back in the Middle Ages and even before. Uh, so it's nothing new. And therefore it's nothing to really get upset about. <laughs> it's nothing to think like, wow, what's going on? Because these same theories have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Then the functionalists or the the Mayavadis, the Gnostics, this, the, the Jnana phase, the Jnanis, they also have their theory of history and conspiracy and so on. But they say the triumph will be oneness. Not in good over evil, but just oneness, realization of oneness. That we're all one and there is no good and evil like that. And then the materialists, they have their philosophy of history. And that's evolution, Darwinism. The human being will gradually evolve, you know, to some super race master of the universe like that. So, then, now, what about this uh, conspiracy theory? Is there something to it? Yes, there is. Very simply, it is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam what the real conspiracy is. Because if you, you know, you talk to these people like that person Ananda was here speaking about one world government and they have some evidence that they give. Now a lot of this evidence is, is garbage speculation but some of it is correct or partially correct and they, they definitely are seeing something. But what is the real conspiracy? That has been explained in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's the personality of Kali. Personality of Kali uh, 5,000 years ago Launched, uh, launched a plot to take the earth from Maharaj Pariket. That's right there, you can read it. Every, we all know the story, how he did it. And we know uh, Kali's means for uh, seducing people away from the Vedic path. It's the four principles of Adharma, four principles of sin. Meat eating, illicit sex, gambling, intoxication. And then there's a fifth uh, principle, hoarding of gold. So you take these ingredients together, you'll definitely see a conspiracy in this world, how it's going on. You know, how the sinful activities are being uh, propagated all around the world. Uh, how people are uh, becoming ensnared by these sinful principles. How they're becoming weakened. They're uh, being turned into two-legged animals and thus they're being easily manipulated by those who have money, those who are hold, hoarding gold. And that's a special place where Kali resides. And the personality of Kali, he's a big demon. His genealogy is explained in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. He's a powerful demon. So he manifests in the intelligence of uh, people who hoarding, are hoarding gold. And uh, he gives them inspiration to do demoniac things. And he, his agents are lust and anger and greed and all of that. that <coughs> these personified beings are controlling people's minds. So this is going on. Kali's pulling all the strings. But these, these people who are propagating these conspiracy theories, they can see something of it. They can see that some this or that string is being pulled. But because they themselves are not in control of their senses, they themselves are also victimized by Kali. 
and they themselves are also involved in sin. So they cannot see perfectly. So then they tried to pinpoint the arch conspirator, David Rockefeller or the Jews or somebody else. They try to lay the whole blame on some, somebody they can see, some visible personality or, per, or group of persons in this world. But they're, they're sadly wrong. Because even though they may